uh, go till six after that, four to six. So we still get our full, uh, you know, four hours. Um, the question for this two hour period is, each artist talks about their early and solo career, including the artist's relationship with Los Angeles, where did they live, have studios, which galleries did they frequent, essentially their mental maps of Los Angeles as an ex uh, artistic community. Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll, you know, and then the second hour, or the second two hours, we'll do the same thing with later work. So let's just think about now, kind of moving from into your college, uh, graduate school into uh, real life as an artist. And okay. same thing, uh, we have a little bit more time now, so 20 minutes to a half an hour, and then another, we're not, yeah, I keep getting this confused. <laughs> Everybody gets a half an hour, 15 minutes, and then 15 minutes to, um, for somebody else to jump in there. Um, we also have images here, and if you're gonna talk about something, uh, you can, hold it up for the camera just as a placeholder and then later they'll uh, insert, it. insert it so it looks good. Um, if you want to show a DVD, um, maybe you can just uh, let us know and then somebody can put it on. We can pop it on as quick as we can so we can still stay within that time frame. Right. Um, but we're going to start with Ulysses. Right. Um, and, and, and we want to start with you kind of going into graduate school graduate and from school. there. Yes. Um, I guess, are you rolling at this point? Oh, okay. Um, what happened to me, actually, like I was saying earlier, uh, I finally got into graduate school at Otis. And of course, getting into graduate school uh, was, was an interesting situation, which I, first of all, I had to convince my mom that the government was after her, <laughs> <laughs> IRS. For, yeah, for, for adjusting for adjusting uh, any kind of uh, uh, amounts that they may not match up with what she's told the government. And so once we got over that hurdle, uh, I, I went on accepted, um, you know, getting accepted into Otis. But it was really an interesting thing happened to me on Mother's Day on the way to the forum. Uh, I had come down to Otis. Uh, as I had sort of went to UCLA earlier. Uh, of course, when I went to UCLA and I met with Gary Lloyd, who uh, was a media artist, sculptor, uh, multimedia artist, I should say, rather. And he told me at the time, when he looked at my work, he said, oh, yeah, no, they, they're not going to accept you in this school. He, you know, and of course, all my, all my work was about black themes. Uh, so he said, you need to go to Otis. And so I kept that thought in mind, not knowing that by the time I got accepted to Otis, he was teaching me, which was kind of a nice thing. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, I was going there to try to talk to some, you know, some of the instructors and, and get a feel for the place, and I run into uh, Raymond Saunders. And so Raymond sort of, you know Raymond, he can be a little tough on you. And that's kind of the approach that he, that he gave me. He's like, well, what are you going to do here? And uh, wh why are you here? And, uh, and so I thought, wow, man. You know, and I, having the, not knowing the, the, what happens when you get into the, to the, the, car, the real art world, uh, I thought, well, I guess people can you know, challenge your, your, your reasoning for going to college or for going to be an artist. Uh, and that was one of the first little signals I got. But of course, like I said, prior to, just, just prior to that, I had been uh, uh, painting murals. And one of the murals that I painted, uh, which still exists today, uh, was on the uh, DMV on Hope Street near USC. It was one of the first murals painted near a freeway in LA. And what uh, year was this? This was, I was painted in 1976. Uh, and it's called Transportation Brought Art to the People, because uh, I was, uh, um, it was a commission that I was that I was that I had won from the DMV, um, and of course, when you asked about uh, Spark, of course, Spark would sponsor artists who have projects, and that's where I got uh, the painting, the paint, and the materials. Uh, 
But uh, of course, uh, a funny thing again happened with this mural. I mean, it was one of my best works, and I, I ran into some subtle conflicts with uh, Ms. Baca uh, when it was time to, you know, to get publicity for this work. And she was running Spark at the time. Yes. Okay. See, I and, and I'll just make a make make a note. I met Judy Baca when I painted my first mural in Venice on the boardwalk. And when was that? That was 1972. Okay. And I wrote this mural called Rat Trap. And I financed the whole thing, and it was on a head shop, and you know, this whole thing. It was a business in the 70s. And um, basically, the mural was depicting Los Angeles sitting on this mouse trap, and that the, the smog was, de was depicted as these skulls, and you know, this whole thing, and these freeways that went into the city from the beach, because the mural faced uh, the ocean. So if you're on the boardwalk, you look up and you're looking east, so it would be like if you're looking in L.A. And the, uh, of course, the, all, the, all, the, all the, uh, the plants along the freeway were these multicolored uh, marijuana plants. Um, and I was sitting at the end of the, of the road um, in the thinker position. <laughs> and of course, new. <laughs> And uh, that was that was my first you know, that was my first mural actually, mm -hmm. and uh, there was another uh, road that went off of the other side of the trap, and it was and it, and it was a uh, uh, sort of like a little little pop art thing. It was called Mr. Goodbar, and it was and so that that whole thing was being held up by these columns that were these um, figurines that were also nude. So I was trying to say that the whole thing is. The whole society is based on this sort of loosely pornographic, mediated culture uh, that was certainly uh, something to do with, with Hollywood, obviously. But the, uh, but this, the thing is, there's certain things that happened in that mirror where I painted in a style where um, technically you're not supposed to be able to do, but I use uh, oil paint and acrylic paint together. And of course, back in those days, you know, since I was financing it myself, I used uh, house paint. And of course, I was fascinated with the fact that you could get different colors in the acrylic than you could in the oil, so I just painted fast and let them dry together. And it worked for a few years. <laughs> so how did you meet Judy Baca? Judy Baca had noticed me painting this mural, and she was putting together this project in the Venice Pavilion to paint the history of Venice. And so I was one of the artists invited to work on that project. Uh, that project probably was one of the, I think one of the, one of the first real uh, community supported mm -hmm. projects because we put on, you know, everything was a la Woodstock back then. And so we put on these concerts in the pavilion with the community and with musicians to raise money where everybody brought mm -hmm. food and all this stuff and, and asked for donations and all the money went towards the money to paint the, uh, the mural inside the Venice Pavilion, right. um, which unfortunately now doesn't exist anymore. So, okay, from, you've, I think I missed something here in, mm -hmm. in the story that you've given us. So, yeah. You've gone from Hawaii, right? Right. To, okay. back to Los Angeles? Right. Uh, with Venice before Otis? Venice before Otis, Venice before Hawaii. Ah, okay. okay. Right. That's right. That was going to be my about. next question. Right. Where does Hawaii? So seventy-two, you're painting your first mural. Right. And, and in seventy-three, I left and go to Hawaii. Okay. And you're there from seventy-three. Seventy-three, seventy-five. Ah. Yeah. And were you making art there? What in Hawaii? Drawing. Yeah, yeah, I was just. I was, but you know, that whole thing is like okay, the political issues. That I try to get people to understand it. You know, Reagan became the governor. You know, young brothers, like not unlike today, you're always getting pulled over for absolutely sometimes nothing. And uh, if you just happen to be, you know, uh, participate in that, uh, that, that, that uh, fragrance of marijuana, then you spend a little time outside of the home. So I, I just got tired of getting harassed. Uh, and actually, I don't know if I sent it to the people here at the Getty, but I found this painting that I had painted and I'm now calling it nothing but the truth. But see, this was, was really, it was a self-portrait, it was life-size, and <clears throat> it's, a, it's a painting of myself in the nude, 
Standing in the middle of the road. Now you know what I mean. <laughs> now this, this, has, this, has, this has some significance, though. But, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's significance. But anyway, I'm standing in the middle of the road giving the finger. Uh, standing on the double yellow lines, which was the double yellow lines are, are represent rules and regulations. And of course, in, in California highway driving, you know, when you have double yellow lines, you cannot pass. So I'm, that's, that was my image of defiance, if you will. That painting, when I was living in Venice, I took it on the boardwalk, because everybody showed their paintings off on the boardwalk back then. The painting gets arrested. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, some of the old folks in in in, uh, in in some of the apartments call the man. The man comes, takes the painting away, and says that if I want it back, I have to come to the police station, literally, like, and bail it out. And that's what happened with the painting. And, yeah. And and so then and then of course. Uh, when I moved to Hawaii, because my mom hated the painting, she wouldn't even let it come in her house, so I couldn't leave it with her. And I gave it, to, I left it with some friends, and of course I never saw the painting again but when I came back to Hawaii. So all I have is this photograph of it. Uh, so, and so that's sort of a part of, I mean, I don't want to go into my, my Venice tour, but the only thing that did, other other thing that happened in Venice, which is important, is that I started shooting video. Because there was a boardwalk, uh, there was a workshop on the boardwalk, uh, I think this guy named John uh, uh, John Baker, and then another guy later on called John Hunt, who called himself Doctor Video, and uh, they had, these these guys a guy named Paul Shalcom, they had come from New York and brought what at that time was called Porter Pack, mm -hmm. and they were letting people rent it out for so that they could pay for it, and so I I was working with some friends of mine. And we did this one, the one video that's really important out of that era uh, was that I went to the Watts Festival. And I recorded the Watts Festival in 72. And um, we got the whole story on how it started with the Sons of Watts and uh, the original uh, organ, uh, director, uh, Thomas Jaquette. Uh, you know, all this information was on that. And, um, it was, it was a very pivotal moment as far as that work. And so in terms of doing that work, that's why I, when, I, when I decided to go into grad school, I said, you know what, I think I'm gonna just go into, you know, with all the history of painters, I think I'm just gonna go into this new media. Mm -hmm. And so I chose, uh, and for as my, my uh, area, when I was at Otis, they had this area called Intermedia. So I went into Intermedia and that, basically is where you could work in any medium, but you had to be able to show your proficiency in it to validate why you're using it. So, that, so that, that's how I started working in video when I went to Otis. And of course, um, while there, I was influenced by performance art. I mean, of course, I'd seen a lot of stuff, but I didn't know it formally as such. Mm -hmm. What were you seeing at Otis? I mean, was there, were there faculty particularly in the performance area or performances being staged there? Well, so at the time that I went to Otis, was probably around the same time that Barbara was at UCLA, um, there was um, Lori Anderson came. Uh, I thought, wow, look at what this woman's doing. And she was just starting to do stuff with that violin. Mm -hmm. She was showing super eight movies mm -hmm. while she was performing and stuff. She was still pretty much doing sculpture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, well, wow, that's an interesting thing. Uh, and then Barbara Smith came. And the stuff that Barbara Smith was, was, was doing at that time, uh, and of course the story that she gave of her leaving her housewife life and becoming an artist and taking all these challenges, I thought, wow, man, if she can take on that kind of stuff, then maybe I could at least attempt something in performance. And uh, so with the combination of the two, I produced Two Zone Transfer. But Two Zone Transfer was also informed by a class, or some classes, I should say, rather, that I took just before I went 
to Otis at Santa Monica College. I took this one class called Blacks in Film, and I can't remember the, the woman, uh, so the black woman who taught the class, who, like, so like what you were talking about, 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 about Barbara, she gave us this whole history of black film and how, you know, Oscar Michaud and the independent ones and, you know, uh, some of the stuff that, that happened, of course, uh, with the, when we get to more contemporary times, uh, uh, what's the name of that film now? Oh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And Stanley, she brought in Stanley Kramer. And so we got a chance to question him. And of course, I wanted to question him about, you know, how did you, I mean, you created this, this scenario and I said, if you put this brother in this situation, he's super brother, you know, to be able to, to be the partner of, 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 this, of, this, of, the, of his white partner. And I said, uh, in, in, the, in the sense of why did you make him have to base his uh, wanting to be with this woman on whether or not uh, these people would approve? I said, you know, what movie is that? guess who's coming to dinner? Oh, oh. And I said, you know, for the most part, Anybody in, in the generation that I came up with just said, screw my parents, I'm going to do this if that's how I feel. And so he said, and which was important, he said, and I think it was probably because about the money, he, he said, I could not create something that I thought society wasn't going to accept. So, and then you look at the timing of this movie, it's just before, of course, Sweetback's Bad Ass Song and the Black Exploitation Era where there is take no prisoners and, you know, whatever else you want to say about that era. So uh, the one thing that I realized over taking that class is that how stereotypes had held the position of not only black actors, but the black character and how that, in a certain stereotypical place, but also how there wasn't, there wasn't nobody's really, like I said, until Sweetback, nobody's really creating something that points at freedom for the black individual and how that could be achieved. And so um, <coughs> also on this time, which is something I talked about, uh, well, I didn't talk to it on, on stage, but I had a conversation with Ed Burrell at the last panel that was here, Cote at Cote. Um, I ran into Ed producing one of his pieces at LA City College. And I walked in, and of course, if Ed Burrell, you know, doing the Black Street Theater, and Bodacious Bubarula and all that stuff. Uh, and as he was telling me, he was telling me, man, we used to bring it to him at the Ash Grove. Um, we talked about these, these images and the images that he had created with this black character who was sort of like a, in white face as Uncle Sam and actually made him look like a really kind of scary individual uh, wearing this, with this American flag and everything. So. I saw this, and he was the first brother I had known of who was working in video besides myself. Later on, of course, I would find out about Tony Ramos. But at this time, it was Ed. And so I created this video called Massive Images. When I was taking the video class, so I was taking this film class, I was taking this, this video uh, class with John Sturgeon, who was a video artist in Venice. And I knew very well, we used to hang out and stuff. So I, this, is my first, this was my first performance piece. And again, I still didn't really know much about that other than delivering some kind of a message, if nothing else. So I created Massive Images, which questioned the whole idea of what was blackface and what is this uh, ideology, if you will, that gets passed off as comedy. I mean, I think this movie that's about to come out is going to have a whole bunch of these characters in it uh, called uh, Sunday. Uh, because most of that stuff I've seen in the previews is serious, stereotypical information there. Uh, it's like information or information. Well, it's both. <laughs> did, you, did you have some of those images in you? Yeah. Yeah, let's see if I didn't. Yes. Is there an image for me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Should be that okay, this is two zone. Right. Well, what we're going to come comes, comes, comes after, after this. And we should right. keep, keep going. Yeah, keep, keep, keep going. Okay. So I should show them up? Or, oh, or yeah, we'll you, can show, you can show, but I mean, just keep, let's get to, yeah. let's okay. speed up the narrative. Right, right, okay. 
and and because there's also no, you can just show these to oh, unless you want to show. Oh uh, no, 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 I was looking to see if Massive Images was in here, but it's no, not. It's not okay. on the list. No, it's not on the list. All right. So, yeah. so anyway, uh, I do Massive Images. Basically, it, it's it's pointing at stereotypical images that are about uh, blacks in the media and uh, you know blackface and how a lot of characters still do blackface even though they don't have to wear the blackface, the corking on the face. Uh, you know, Old Dirty Bastard might be one in terms of the reinvention of uh, some, some hip hoppers don't know this history, so they tend to, it's all about the money. That's why those images are created. Uh, so after, after that, moving right along here in, in Otis, I create this piece called Two Zone Transfer. And of course, what happened when I make Two Zone Transfer it uh, also has the other uh, three uh, uh, African Americans who are going to school with me, Greg Pitts, Kerry Marshall, and Ronnie Nichols. And we collaborate on my production. I mean, I wrote the script and all that, but in terms of actually producing it, there was some, we had a lot of fun and all this stuff. Um, it basically is a narrative based on uh, this, African American individual who goes to, who goes who goes to bed. He wakes up. He's having this dream. He wakes up and there's these three minstrels sitting at the foot of the bed, and they're putting on blackface. They also happen to have on masks themselves, which are two Fords and a Nixon. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, uh, the Nixon obviously is very obvious because it's the '70s, and he's getting he's got booted out of the White House. The two Fords represented, you know. Uh, one in the White House and one in Detroit. So basically, I'm, and they're putting on blackface and I'm asking them what's up and they're telling me, well, you know, we've been using your image for a long time. Don't even try to put us down because we use the Irish back in England. So then we sort of go from there to uh, the church. So I wanted to make a, a, a statement about the conservative movement that was happening at the early 70s or late 70s. And the, and the, the scene opens up with Kerry Marshall with the Nixon mask playing a church hymn. And then we break from that to me doing this black preacher thing, and Greg and Ronnie are the deacons, and um, we do this. I do this whole spiel about Noah, and of course the whole thing in biblically about how black people got uh, cursed by Noah because of his son Ham, who laughed at him because he got intoxicated and put a curse on him the rest of his life. And so what I do is just throw the inference in as a little sort of double whammy on the Christian things. Like, okay, if you're saying we're slaves, then I'm gonna throw this back at you because of JC, we're supposed to be free of your madness. Um, if, you, um, if you if you give us storylines, we're not gonna get to hear Okay, right. I'll stop. Okay, right, I'll stop. Right, Thank right, you, right. you gotta stop me because I'm gonna call right, you. Right. I've been doing what? this for so long. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, this is just a picture from Two Zone, and it just happens to be in the live production of it. I had my niece um, uh, with me uh, as a part of a, a, a musical part of, of, the, of the live performance, mm -hmm. just saying, t t speak, trying to speak to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Now I noticed in your filmography, videography, mm -hmm. that some of the earlier pieces, it seems to me, besides you know two zone transfer of massive images um, are kind of historical in a way. I mean, you're talking about the Watts Festival. You have a piece which you call King David, which is about David right. Hammond. Right, this is that's this one. And you have um, another one, um, Charles White. Charles White. Right. Right. So it seems like the early ones are kind of addressing uh, on the one hand with these two massive images and two right. zone transfer you're you're talking about the imagery of right. African Americans throughout history in terms of the film medium. Now, in the other part of this section of your early work, it's kind of another way of addressing that by doing these historical pieces. Right. And I wonder, well, how did, you, that did you do you see that as like two sides of the coin? Um, in that before? sense, uh, I catch up with actually defining that after I get through, or actually when I start doing um, Dream City. But for the most part, I started out as a documentarian. And so that history part plays a large part of it. But I also recognized when I did the Watts Festival, see the reason why, after I shot the Watts Festival, I said, the, nobody's coming to the community and shooting us and telling the truth and seeing it for what it really is. 
You know, all you got on the TV was like, oh, if you go to watch it, something's going to happen to you, so don't go out there. And meanwhile, when you go there, you have a really great time. So there was a conflict for me on that level. And of course, going to Otis and actually having an opportunity to study with Charlie, I thought, what a great opportunity to shoot something on him and, uh, you know, his relevancy. Um, but to, to get back to what you're, you're pointing at, after I do Two Zone, and of course, there's one piece that I didn't, that's not, I don't know if I sent that to, these, to everybody here, but I do have it on, it's gonna be on my website, I think. I did this, this piece called Just Another uh, Rendering of the Same Old Problem. And that's my graduate thesis project. And in that project, I, I do this sort of piece where I come out, I'm just up like a janitor, and everybody comes into this, to the room for, this, for, for the uh, performance. They don't even recognize who I am because they think I'm a janitor. I'm sweeping up and all this stuff. So then I take the janitor's clothes off, sit down to a table like this, and I pick up this book and I start reading. There's a monitor on this, on this table. I reach down under there, because I'm reading like this with instructions, I reach down, pull out this box, put the box on the table, look into it, read some more, put my hands in there, and take out this dildo. And the dildo has a black face on the head. <laughs> What's the piece called again? Just another rendering of the same old problem. <laughs> and so then I start to scream, no, 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 and I get up, grab a, a, a prop, but it's a, it's a gun, and I start shooting at the dildo, because basically I press the button and the dildo's doing its thing. So I'm starting to shoot it, and there's a camera focused on the dildo so that you see the dildo in the TV set. So this, this whole statement is about the black male as a sexual object, right? So then, I, as I'm saying, no, 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 I take off my clothes, and so I, I've got on pasties, and these little silk <laughs> drawers, right? And this is a graduate school production. Right. This is what graduate school does to people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to school with all these feminists too, okay? <laughs> so the feminist movement's going on. So anyway, uh, so after I shoot the thing, so all the time I practice this piece, I never shot the dildo. In the piece, I shoot the dildo. The dildo falls over, and the face is looking straight up at the camera. And so you see this head going like this in the monitor, right? So anyway, long story short, the piece ends when I turn off the dildo and walk away. And that's the statement. You can't stop this thing. All you can do is walk away from it. So, then, so that, was, that was that piece. So then, after I do that piece, I um, do inconsequential dog row. In between, actually, I do inconsequential dog row and I, no, 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 no. Okay, I'm going ahead myself. Okay. But about that time. I, I, do, I do a Columbus Day dog row. But, but maybe rather than going through each piece. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go through all the pieces. We're, we're running out of time. time. Did we, um, didn't we kind of hook up in all of this? See, around this time, when I, when I had done the Watts Festival tape, I was in New York getting it shown at a downtown video festival, downtown community festival, and I ran into you in New York. There was some show that you were having, and I think, uh, um, Was it a jam? She says, uh, yeah. Just about the time? Yeah, she says, she says you, you might have had a show just about midtown. Because this is about 1980? This was, yeah, around 1980 or so. Mm -hmm. And I met you, and we said we'd hook up when we get back to L.A. And I think when we hooked up, you introduced me to Sanger. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I did this piece on a, my, a small piece at my studio that I just got from, from Carrie Marshall called Adams B. Dog. Okay. And I yeah, you do remember? I think I do. Yeah, you and I and Sanger. Sanger was, Sanger was dressed like this Orisha. And I had, I, the thing was, I was testing the boundaries between the audience and uh, the performers. And the, the, the audience became the performers and vice versa. And we were digging in this earth to find this little uh, glass pyramid, which was a symbol of self. Can you find yourself? And you did, well, there should be an image of is there? for Adam's B. Dog. Oh, really? OK. I, I, I want to ask you generally. Um, yeah, he was the. Uh, you know, as you move from this kind of history dealing with the, the stereotype images that kind of right. comes out of your, in a way, comes out of your graduate school experience, uh -huh. dealing with the history of African Americans, but through artists, then you get into this kind of, how should I describe it, 
about dreams, dream stay, the, the place of the griot, and right. I wonder how you know moving from this idea of the stereotype to the idea of the griot as a kind of organizing idea of your early works. Right. How do you do that, and, and what is the situation? Well, what happens there along uh, uh, during that time, of course, and this is the thing I hope that I'm sure they'll chime in on this too. That we're all having conversations mm -hmm. with each other about what is informing our work and we're seeing each other's work and of course what big a big influence on me during this time was the water rituals that Parker was doing. Yeah. Really. That piece just blew me away. And probably even the shopping bag. I mean your work just like I was like, oh my God. And <laughs> and uh, and it made me because on one hand I was see when I was at Otis, the thing that was getting at me was that first of all, 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 all of the white students were telling me, oh, you'll never have a career because you're doing that black stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm going like, what are you talking about? And, and then at the other end of it, they're telling me that you know you can't have a career if you're going to be doing work that's based in Eurocentric culture. Mm -hmm. So to get away from the quandary of that and to look back into the culture and try to find, and I have been thinking, see, I've been thinking about it, uh, some other work that I could not produce when I was at Otis because of the time. So that's why when I got out, I started doing these other works. And um, of course collaborating with, I mean I want to say this too uh, before I get my, lose my time. I was blessed and so fortunate to have met these women at this time in my career, uh, not only because of who they are, but the work that they were doing. Um, that that in helped inform the, the work that I was doing. I mean, now the other thing that people have to realize, we, for me, there could, you couldn't get any kind of information that we were feeding each other in the art world. Mm -hmm. That didn't exist, especially on the West Coast. So, uh, for the most part, in that sense, I tend to think that all the work that we were doing sort of was like a school within itself. Uh, that we were able to help each other. As a matter of fact, there was a part of that time that we actually were putting each other in shows that could, we had this sort of little pact about if you get a show, can you get us in? And that helped a lot to, for us to get things perpetuated, I thought. Uh, so, back to your question though, the whole thing seemed, seemed like when I did Dream City, Dream City was a major hit. When was that? That was after I did Adams B. Dog World, and that was in, in 1981 or so. And I, I still don't understand how and why Rachel Rosendahl was going to let me open up her new studio. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the fact that I was going to be bringing in this sort of, sort of ritualized piece, and that was a total ritual, 18 hour ritual. Just really, it's 24 hours. Well, it's you know how this thing is like it's like this. It's always on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, can you say a couple of words and then? Sorry, but we'll no, no, come I, back to it. It. I know. In the, in the I last remember. part. Yeah. I um, yeah. Yeah. But just say a couple of words about it now. And What's that? Dream City or? Oh yeah, yeah. That we're talking final, about. I would say that, I would say that for this yeah. area because Dream City is, is very pivotal. Okay. Because basically. I use the context of, of, of ritual as well as media, as well as you know live, live performance, live performative kind of things. And then I tested this whole thing about audience and boundary. Because you know, at the end of that piece, Barbara walks in with Don Cherry. I'm in the I'm in the middle of the piece nude, and where everybody's singing happy and, then, and she brings a birthday cake, and everybody starts singing happy birthday in your birthday suit. And then of course the other thing. Sang and I have birthdays uh, one day apart, and we tended to start doing performances on our birthdays, which was always a celebration for the both of us. So that was sort of interesting uh, in the way that we worked. So uh, and he woke us up, got us over there at four o'clock in the morning with a dead, rotting cat. Exactly. <laughs> with Megas. And I was like, oh, I know. Well, the thing about see, the thing about that. The, See, the, the whole thing about doing the rituals was you had to have a metaphor. And so I was trying to say, what am I going to do for this piece? And that week, when I was going home, this, this black cat got run over. And it was just laying there. And I said, you see, there it is. Got run over by technology. <laughs> Nobody is going to pick it up because they're afraid of the taboo. 
There's my metaphor. So the thing was, that one thing is that happened early in the week. So I had to store the cat uh, for about plastic bag. Yeah, for about about four days or five uh, days or so. So that when I brought it out, oh the aroma. Oh man. And of course, when I brought that cat out, the thing about when we started that piece, the piece started at six in the morning. And I didn't think anybody was gonna be there. There were like these three nurses that were standing up there. I said, man, this is sort of cosmic. And they're, you know, I'm there with the cats, I'm nude. And she's and the and the nurses are going, don't let the maggots get on you. <laughs> don't let the maggots get on you. They hot for something. They hot. Something like that. <laughs> oh Lord. And so you know, I mean, that's 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 a little bit of Dream City because the thing that was really fantastic, 15 minutes performance every two and a, every two two hours and 45 minutes, and as the as the the pieces were recorded, they were played back. For the audience who could buy, you know, maybe pay one admission, go and come back. So that by the time midnight came, there was this incredible video there that caught everybody up to what the piece meant and what was going on. So that by midnight, like I said, all the performers came back. Sang and Sang and Mary came down, and Sang was in costume and everything, and the whole thing just broke wild. It was, and it's on tape if you want to see it. Um, Rachel, well, let's stop here. Yeah. Let's let's go to Barbara because this whole idea of the ritual that you're talking about right. and the influence of women in ritual and the influence of uh, shopping bag. Well, water ritual is the one thing you yeah. said. Like first, one thing about that that also uh, Ulysses did a lot of multicultural things. So it wasn't right. just black people. That's right. I should have said that. Yeah. That, uh, okay. Actually, Dream City was probably one of the biggest. I think first multicultural performances in LA. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people from all different cultures contributing to the expression within the piece. Uh, and the piece that I really uh, want to make note of was the one that uh, Nobuko Miyamoto did yeah, yeah. called uh, uh, Sleep, All Sleeping Women Awake and Rise. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And of course, if you don't know who she is, she was in Walk on the Wild Side. She was in West Side. Oh, West, you know, West Side Story. Thank you. She played Puerto Rican. Right, West right. So. <laughs> but she's Japanese. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that was, you know, and, and that piece is like really beautiful because when she does it, Sang and Marin come out and join with her. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was one. Of, there was a lot of significant pieces in that piece, but that one I want to just raise. Okay, it's a beautiful. Time. Well, let's uh, yeah. go on with Barbara, and I'm sure there'll be some more overlap. Okay, I, okay, Ulysses brought a good point about you know, ritual and the importance of ritual. I think it came from my Catholic background and also looking at Catholicism and saying, well, okay, Catholicism has incorporated you know, things more co-opted things from different spiritual practices. Okay. And which is why, you know, like, you know the, the chanting, the incense, the being, you know, I, I, I want to say gongs, but I'm, I'm not quite sure where I got that from. But it comes from somewhere, you know, in my past in terms of dealing with Catholicism that these things were, you know, became very you know, active in my consciousness. And, and at the same time, I was discovering who I was as a creative person. And I wanted to, you know, to really cross paths with other women who were doing, you know, artwork. And I wanted to basically have some kind of a, a way of let's say, okay, fine, let's dispel anything that been negative uh, with us in the past that we can, like, you know, come together. And so at Barbara O's house, who's an actress who's from the Adams and Lily films, we have this kind of gathering at her house where different women were like, you know, invited. And uh, basically, everybody was asked to bring something that was symbolic of, uh, of uh, an important thing in their life. It could be a thing, it could be a picture. For my, um, my case, it was a picture of my grandmother who I'd never met, but who at the time was so much around me that it was really overwhelming. She died when I was 12 years old. Well, anyway, that was like the beginning of it. And um, one of the women who had come to that, you know, I talked to her later, and she was saying that her husband did not want her to actually ever participate in anything like that again because, you know, it was negative, it was, you know, it was questionable, and, and it really, like, shocked me because I'm going, this was, a, this was, you know, a way of basically saying, okay, fine, let's, let's grow and learn from each other, and let's, you know, basically, you know, create a situation where we could, you know, move forward as creative women. Well, it just, it, it just floored me so much. It says, okay, fine, I have to figure out what this is all about. You know, what does ritual mean to me? And, you know, what does it mean to other people? And maybe the easiest path to understanding what it means to me is to ask other people. And that's why I wound up going first to, you know, to, you know, to Betty Sarr. And all this was, again, at, you know, it's through UCLA, because I think I mentioned earlier that the experience at UCLA was different from, I think, the Big House experience might have been, because as filmmakers and video artists, one of the problems was access to the tools. Right. So 
people who basically went through the UCLA experience, I mean, even the people who had gone before us, you know, the men who had gone there and that, you know, they call it was still, you know, still there, and that we collaborated and did, you know, things together. And he, you know, and he, and he influenced me and I think I influenced him. But going back to this whole idea, it's like, what does this mean? You know, like, what does this mean? You know, um, and so, you know, UCLA was like, this, it was like the studio from which all the artists and you know, filmmakers were basically work. We were able to stay there for a very long time. There was no limit on how long we could stay. I think Charles Brennan had been there for just eight years, nine years. You know, maybe without was, graduating. Without without graduating. And finally he, you know, he did his, his killer sheet, which, you know, now has made his thing. And, you know, so that was like a very different period of time. I mean, UCLA had sixty millimeter equipment. You know, they had sound equipment, it had lighting equipment. And for the chosen three few, it was thirty five millimeter equipment. So it was like, you know, he was you there, you, you could work as long as you could, you know, uh, you know, do the coursework and you pay your tuition or get the whatever it was, the grant to get, you know, to pay your tuition. So that was the, the, the mechanism by the way I was able to like go around and ask people. And the very first person I talked to about um, what ritual meant to her was Lynn Saar. And we had done a gallery walk at Gen Long Gallery. And that was like really, you know, pretty, pretty amazing experience. And I had, you know, some great people talk to me. And uh, I had, I think, Roger Clayton Young, I think he was basically doing the same with the, uh, who's the big guy with her. And I just had a wealth of people who were helping. Problem, the sound was not monitored. Mm -hmm. The sound was not there. So when I go back to look at this wonderful video, you know, this gallery wall showing all of Betty's wonderful works, there was like no sound associated with this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do now? What am I gonna do now? So I says, well, Betty's not available. She's really busy. So maybe I need to go talk to some of the people, you know, and find out what ritual was to them, you know, because, you know, I felt like, well, I don't want anybody to put this negative thing on me. I want to, you know, approach it from, if not necessarily from, you know, a scholarly point of view, but from the point of view of artists who I saw had some aspects of ritual in their work, you know, um, you know repetitive. Repetitive spiritual motivated movement, you know, something in the artwork that showed that, uh, something that was cathartic. Um, and so that's how I wound up talking to, you know, a lot of different people. And, and I wound up being sort of like a documentarian, you know, um, you know, you know, talking to David Hammers, which is really interesting because, you know, David was the first person that I think I uh, I put on the, you know, the tape, and there were other people because I, I talked to Sang, and Sang was doing this incredible project. You know, she was doing this, this project down under the freeway, you know, and she had wrapped the freeway poles with the, you know, Chris Bakken uh, sculptures, and we had, you know, the names of our sons on it, you know, and that was like, oh my God, this is so cool, you know, and and that was like, for me, just wonderful. I mean, it was like, when I talk about people who really influenced me, it was Betty and Sanka and Zora Neale Hurston, you mm -hmm. know, and that, that was kind of like, you know, it, because, and of course, you know, I was going to say me, but it was like these were women who were doing really creative works. I had in common with them that I was also a mother, you know, so it was like we had a base. And so, and Sam was always coming up with these incredible, interesting ideas. And she was doing it in such a quiet way, you know, and I used to, my personal title for her was this quiet man woman. Because <laughs> you never know what she was going to do. She was going to say or you know come up with, and she just you know it was so matter of fact. You know it was almost like you know to me you know and now she's like okay you have this this, this musician basically who has gone and crafted you know he's got these skills together basically now he's ready to do improvisation. You know so that that's how I kind of like saying. Okay. Now what about artists? I mean you do you know um, your film on Chopping Bad Spirits, on artists, primarily on artists, um, musicians, you know, poets. He does the early films on artists. What is it about these artists? And it's it's artists of the time, you know? Story, the stories. Yeah. The it's, stories. Yeah, I would say this too, because Betty Sarr was, of course, when I was there going to Otis, was, was the one who was also influencing me in, in, this, in terms of this ritual context. But the stories, believe me, the stories that Charles White used to tell me and I was going to Otis, I mean, they were in fact, absolutely invaluable. And so were the ones that Betty saw it said, it said. But see, the thing was, to get the opportunity to get 
the relationship, not unlike what we're doing now on a, on a regular basis, was so invaluable. Like I said, there's no outside sources to feed this, let's just get it real here, to feed blackness, you know? And for the most part, the reality of where we were coming from, from the social realities that, that we were going through in the era uh, about freedom, we were defining our freedom not only individually, but culturally. And to define our cultural freedom, what became a real, real issue when you were being told, no, nah, you can't come into these galleries. And, and um, if it wasn't for Barbara and Greg Pitts and people yeah, like right. that, that were willing to write about us and document us, we didn't exist because high performance. Right. Now, Ulysses was hooked in with, I won't say any names, but, you know, we never got in that perform, you know. Uh oh. Oh well, yeah, well, no, well. See, <laughs> see, that didn't, that didn't, see, but that didn't help me get into high performance. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. You guys tucked into this stuff, but I mean, I got in high performance because I wrote the reviews. That's 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 how high performance they functioned. Never, you wrote the reviews of your own pieces. That's how high performance magazine functioned when you, okay. when it first started out. If okay. you as an artist could write at least a sentence that said, "I did this on this day," they would publish it. So I said, you know, I need to, and that was a part of the whole conceptual art school of thought. You know, that the artist has to define himself and and be the critic and and all that kind of stuff. Because it's the not just to to get in that in that way as well. Well, of course, they never. Marin, they never did any of our stuff. No, ever. And and and, they didn't and even bother to talk. And about I just want to add to that. But but when and you can have it back, um, Marin. But but see, when they did start having people writing, they did not write about us. So now, right. so so go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say the only person I ever remember writing about anything we ever did was Francine Farr. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and and yes. we were really trying to cultivate Francine. Yes, exactly. To help us get exactly. this side of there. And it wasn't. It wasn't hard to cultivate her. She was interested. Yeah, yeah I know. But I'm just. Yeah. I'm just thinking it. But she had. Yeah, you know, she had a you know a logical interest in what right. we were doing. But the the art you know the majority art world you know just wouldn't have it. But that's why and that's including feminists. And that's why we're here now, because they didn't feminists, see our yes, work feminists. as anything, especially not our being God. No. Well, it was very racist. Yeah, well. It's and exclusive. In a little exclusive. Kind of way. <laughs> well, Barbara, continuing on with your narrative. Yeah, well, no, 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 this is what's supposed to happen. But we, well, no, we go back. Well, in terms of you know, helping, you know, getting the work done, you know, the technical support you know, that you need, people are glad to be in, like film and video came from the people at UCLA at the time. That I worked with, they were, they were primarily women, you know, and they were also, you know, like you said, like Caldwell and, and uh, who came later. But um, that was the way in which we worked. It was collaboration all along because basically, you know, that's the way you get your work done. Jimmy did her work, Shannon did work, did her work, you know, put them on who did, you know, her work, and basically you, you crew for each other. But what about the relationship with the larger feminist movement? So I know no, you no, guys no. sound like a feminist crew. I mean, you yeah. had your black feminist film well, crew down there. Because that's what was what available. available. Right. That was who was available, and that's what, who was offering. I mean, it was like you had the black filmmakers, you had the Latino filmmakers, you had a smattering of you know things like that. Well, actually, not really, because by that time, uh, most of the Asian filmmakers had gone. So UCLA grew out of the ethno, ethno uh, right. so ethnology, ethnographic film department, uh -huh. oh, okay. right? And then you know, then they, they got rid of that and they embraced you know you know you know into that you know, film department, right? But there but, were, but there was no relationship to the feminist art movement. No. Mm -hmm. But with uh, Barbara kind of just glazed over ah. this uh, event that happened. Wasn't it in Pasadena? Yeah, it was Pasadena. Yeah, it was one pose in Barbara O's backyard, which was quite large, and uh, I remember uh, uh, Kinshasa was there, and a number of people were there, and it was generational, too, because there were children, there were young girls, there were, you know, people that were our age, there were, you know, our mother's age, and so on. So it was this big circle that we kind of created a ritual, I mean, our own ritual, and so there was this power circle, which is probably why maybe that person's husband <clears throat> so excited, but there was this, I can't describe the power of all of these women 
coming together, certain, you know, of all ages, and there was just an energy force that was created in this circle. So that is a feminist thing. I mean, you know. It was right. But, I'm, but I'm asking about the relationship to the to the larger feminist art movement as right. we know it that's being celebrated for the right. last year right. with shows right. like WAC and, right. Right. and so on. Right. And so I'm just wondering, if, you know, besides yeah. the women's building, and the women's building was a whole other story. Yeah, that was a whole other thing. And, yeah, but it was, it was really, you know, like the movement itself, in the broadest sense of the movement, it was an upper middle class white woman movement. Right, well, I would say this as a, as a guy watching all these sisters, you know, and the way you know, you're like, man, look at the sisters, they got all this power, they're putting together, you know. Uh, and, and so, I mean, in a, in a way, I mean, especially when you said Barbara, oh, because she was she was a very tall sister yeah, in yeah, stature, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and you know she really stood out, and uh, and, and so. She was an actress in some very powerful films. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, and also it's before that, it was, uh, yeah, freezing. <laughs> before that, it was Wish Mama, and also right. and that was a very you know powerful film that Javier Bardem made. Right. You know, and and, and basically the, the politics. I mean, politics were very much involved in filmmaking at UCLA. Uh, until about the early, I would say like something like 70, oh, the mid 70s, okay? It was interesting because there was, um, um, everything seemed to have to, to be accepted, you know, as a black filmmaker, you have to have this real heavy duty message within your, you know, your film community, you know, your, your projects. And it was like, because I used to call, you know, Haley, um, her regular, you know, he had, he was a part of the sledgehammer school of filmmaking <laughs> because the message was there, it was direct, it was in face, you know, and it was and it was raw, you know, it was very, very raw. And I just didn't see myself making, you know, doing projects like that. I, you know, I, I guess I had a different touch, you know, and basically I didn't feel like I needed to be quite that overt in my message, you know, in terms of what was um, important for me to you know, portray or for me to, to basically use as a vehicle to my, my my point across. And also because of the time I felt like, okay, this was the early 80s, okay, and there's a lot of stuff from the 60s and the 70s basically that did not work, you know, and, you know, I felt it was a time of, you know, of introspection as opposed to, you know, just, you know, being overt about, you know, about your message and, you know, things need to be clarified within in order to really get your message out, you know, and so my approach is really different, and I think some other you know, folks' approaches are really, really different, and so knowing these people basically help that because I could, you know, see what they were doing and the message was in some cases much more subtle than what I was used to in getting the, the, the support environment. And then as that support environment changed, like you said, the women group that had come into um, Jamaican filmmaking, Julie, Julie's uh, project, um, Dark and African Nun, which is based on a short story by Alice Walker, you know, that was really, you know, very, very interesting, interesting. And I was also, Treated relatively to the Grass Valley Switcher, you know, which basically, you know, that was very, very cool to me to be able to go and you know, have solarized images and, you know, and at the same time colorize things and, you know, have, have like a palette of color changes and things. And it was, and it also it had to do with, you know, emotional states, you know, the colors basically um, symbolizing emotional states. And so that was something that was for me very important to show because again it was going to the whole cathartic thing that going within, you know, and also giving a bit of what the story was from other people basically who had um, had an I had ideas that I felt were similar to what I wanted to explain and also understand because it was really about me understanding. And so this is why Zora was so you know important to me because you know she went into these different communities basically and was able to extract you know the beauty of those you know, communities and they sort of you know, put out in her own words. And so I, you know, living at the time on 59th Street in Maine, because I had moved from where I was living on 24th Street over to, with my maid at the time, over to a um, studio on 59th in Maine with my kids, you know, all around that older community of LA, um, um, which used to be kind of bordering, you know, what was what was in the heart of, you know, like Central Avenue. It was like the spread, it was like living in the South, really. Mm -hmm. Because you had, you know, you had older people sitting on the front porch, you know, you had a junkyard looking dog, you know, maybe something that looked, you know, like maybe needed to be, 
you know, some repair, some attention. But at the same time, you know, you go walking around the neighborhood and the stories were just incredible. I mean, there were just really some incredible stories and the people that you saw. You were sworn in some of those streets that you were, you know, you were back country in Mississippi or something. And it was, you know, like what we now call, you know, like uh, South Central. But it's like, you know, and that, I have a Mississippi is probably a bad term. But anyway, you know, it was where um, old, a lot of old black people lived. And so there were stories. You know, there was always stories to tell. And I was also interested in old journalism too. So that kind of like coupled, um, you know, my interest in, you know, um, you know, finding out what people were about. And I guess I just had sort of like a natural, I never had a knack for talking to people and finding out what they're about. And so it's sort of like naturally started a film called, called Fears Don't Have to Be. And that film never got really finished because I got really energetic because I said, oh, okay. I had gone to New York the time that that, um, that show at PS1. Afro American <laughs> Abstraction. Yeah. Okay, and then I went and wanted to see it. I had met James Phillips. And I had gone to New York specifically to work on a project called Who Are the New Jazz People? And this was like in 1980. Well, they weren't actually new, but they weren't exposed to a larger audience. And I was trying to do the idea of, you know, um, music artists from LA, from St. Louis, um, in Chicago, and how people wanted to be there going to New York. You, know, you, you talk about James Phillips, not the artist. Yeah. The, the artist, artist James yeah. Phillips. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and he had, you know, basically we had talked a lot, and, you know, and he helped me. And I went and talked to Max Roach. We talked to a lot of people to basically get them. Uh, to support this project because I was going to like submit, you know, uh, you know, grant proposals to what they're funding for. And, well, as it so happened, I got an, an, an NEA grant for basically for the research of it, and basically it was not going to get me through the other film. So I was, you know, energetic, okay, and all this other stuff happened, and fears, and I'm going to start this project when Morris Capps happened, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I had about, oh, I guess I had about four or five different projects going. The, the ingredient that was missing from all of this was money. <laughs> and so they just sort of like sat on the shelf, you know, and did not get completed because of that. But you know, it was a really good time because around the early, the early 80s, in particular into the mid 80s, um, it was great because Julie Dash had gone to Con Festival because she was her job, her other job, her day job was working for the Ravens Board. And so she, um, for two years in a row, she had gone to Con to Review films before she went, but also to participate in that because as, you know, as being a part of that segment of the academy, you know she had you know, entree to go to Khan. Mm -hmm. And so the next time around, she says, "Dad, I want to go." So she says, "Why don't we go and take all these films?" So what we did is we had Charles Burnett had a short film called *The Black Horse*. We had *The Little Bears* film. We had um, *Carol Fair and Bruce Miller* and *Honeymoon*. Oh goodness! All, all together, I think we had about six films in the short films. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, her friend at the time was a filmmaker who had been in their uh, previous, the previous year because I think it was director's fortnight or something like that they called it and basically it was um, documentary you know, film and new directors and he had been a part of that film and he had met Julie and basically he helped us along in terms of writing a screenplay. He helped us in terms of, uh, uh, he had one of the, some guy who was doing film posters do our flyers for the event. And so we went at the screening room at Con and we screened these films. And it was it was a great experience. It was a you know really, really great experience because at Con you had like, you know, a population of somewhere like three to five thousand journalists. Mm -hmm. And within that somebody's going to either write about you or they're going to invite you to festivals because festival people, you know, did go to, you know, those um, to, to Con to basically see the films. Uh, primarily from you know, the, the lesser known because there was a big, you know, big industry and stuff, and there was a lesser known stuff. And they were interested in the lesser known stuff. So from that, um, from that experience, there's an actual, which was, I think it was the department store in, in Paris, basically, and they had put on this after film festival, well, which was afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, then a lot of people wanted to get invited to film festivals, you know, based, you know, based on, on that. And it was really, really exciting. And from that, and from that experience, um, Clyde Taylor